Okay, so I'll, I think uh, we'll use this opportunity to like quick welcome to start. Um, Dr. Lars uh, Schwenk, who just completed his PhD at Humboldt University um, with a dissertation on biopunk dystopias, genetic engineering, society, and science fiction. He's also done, a in addition to his regular master's, he did a master's in higher education. Um, we worked on uh, research learning, which we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. today, which is intriguing pedagogical strategy. Um, he teaches at the Institute of British and American Studies at the University of Hamburg, currently. Um, publishes actively a book on magic, myth, and Tony Morrison's Song of Sol Solomon. Three co-edited books on the fantastic and also on the cultural <coughs> imagination from the Middle Ages to the 21st century, so quite a, quite a spectrum. Um, publishes a lot, a lot of articles and book chapters that center on issues of the fantastic, both in this German sense and broader sense, um, science fiction, uh, horror, and of course, cultural notions of utopia, and especially dystopia. Um, he's president of the Gazelle Shop, who are fantastic for show. Um, and I think with that, we'll let you go. All right. Well, well thank you all for, for coming and uh, for, in, for the invitation to this uh, wonderful campus and uh, all the hospitality you've shown me. It's been a, a, a great day, uh, very, a lot of talking, so I hope my, my voice still keeps going up with this one. Um, um, my, as uh, William has said, my, most of my research so, um, centers on the fantastic or on popular culture and aspects of the fantastic. I've um, been doing this in mostly contemporary media forms. Um, the visual is one of my larger interest uh, areas, so film, television, video games. Um, and for today I have chosen um, to talk about the peculiarities of the contemporary horror film in Germany. Um, and for that, I would like to give an overview of the recent horror <coughs> film production as a kind of a, a basis, a grounder for us, and then uh, delve into uh, uh, an analysis of the film Hell by Tim Philbaum, which is a very interesting, intriguing um, directorial debut. And just as a dis disclaimer, Hell in German means bright, whereas Hell in English means uh, obviously hell, um, <laughs> the opposite of up there. Um, for the film, the German term makes more sense, as you can see, because it talks about you know, a very bright future. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to pronounce it German, but when talking in English, the American accent kind of sneaks in. So uh, this is supposed to be the German meaning most of the time, uh, even if I pronounce it wrong in English because of that how that kind of comes out every now and then. So um, I see this film as part of a, um, a wave of horror films that um, have been produced after 2000, which I call the post-millennial horror film. Um, and these, these are actually films that continue um, the critique of, uh, of, of social realities of the horror film of the 1980s and 90s um, but kind of make this genre more accessible in terms of mainstream um, and kind of get into a dialogue with Hollywood genres, with the question of how um, consumers are being fed on Hollywood expectations and the German horror film now has to kind of get into a, a dialogue about the conventions and kind of breaking up conventions um, while at the same time this, these kinds of films address uh, both the, the history of German film and the, qu the history of German horror film and kind of renegotiate that and kind of find their position in that. Um, so on the one hand, this fil these films are national and German in a sense, have a distinctive Germanness, but they're also what uh, Randall Hall calls the, they're part of the transnational aesthetic. Uh, so they have a, a, a transnational appeal and Randall Hall actually says most famously about film that film nowadays on any visual products that we're talking about are globalized. So we, we cannot really ta talk about film without thinking of the globalized structure, how they're produced. But if transnationalism is actually the key issue here, how can we actually even talk about German film? How can we talk about a national cinema? And Jennifer Kapczynski and Michael Richardson actually say about this that um, these 
categories have become shifting and porous, but are still kind of our groundwork. We are still starting from the idea of a national cinema, and at this point, not really sure what categories to put this in. Is it just nationality, so Austrian wouldn't be German anymore? Or is it language? Or is it production style? So I'm going to go with a broad aspect of taking anything German produced as German cinema at the moment. Uh, but all of these films are actually German language films as well. Some of them are Austrian, uh, and Tim Fehlbaum in this case is even Swiss. So um, I'm taking that approach there. Um, key for all of these films, though, is, and this is something that German cinema has dealt with a lot, um, is the question of the specific markers of national identity. How do we produce a German film that actually is German? Uh, and this is a kind of something that consumers have used over the years and that internationally um, consumption has become something like Germanness is a plus, but in specific terms. Uh, we, we think of German films as addressing specific topics. Um, so German national cinema over the last 50 years has kind of been this balancing act of what is German and what is transnational. And I would like to really quickly go into that for um, a minute, starting with the new German cinema, which from the 1960s and 70s on has become a very internationally lauded film, uh, um, cin or uh, lauded cinema. So when we're talking about German cinema, um, in terms of history, we either come out with expressionism, which is 1930s, or we come out with new German cinema as the two uh, avant-garde movements kind of that define German cinema. So if you look at a German film history, these are the two markers that kind of stick out. Uh, these films are actually politically and socially very critiquing of Germany and of German nationality, of German history. So they uh, are, um, as Eric Rentschler puts it, programmatic endeavors which um, saw the purpose of film as interrogating images of the past in the hope of refining memories and catalyzing changes. I quote Eric Rentschler because he defines the period that comes afterwards as what he calls the cinema of consensus, uh, which on the other hand um, is kind of a reaction to what came before because audience interest in cinematic art and in expression like that kind of dwindled. Uh, financing kind of stopped financing art projects and kind of got into the idea of economic success. So we finance something that promises to have a big budget at the box office. Um, these stories are more popular, they're lighter entertainment, they're kind of vapid is usually the term that's being used for these films. Um, they're user friendly, they're very affirmative in a sense, they kind of give the feeling of this is well, how we are, what we are, and this is very uncritical. Um, so Renschler says about this, that the cinema of consensus did not sell abroad because it was perceived as both too German and yet not German enough. Um, it had generic designs that were not readily exportable because they were done better and more effectively elsewhere. So during this period, uh, globalization kind of means we get more money for internationally. Some stars and uh, directors move from Germany to Hollywood, good example. Uh, Roland Emmerich, who was a German director and then became the most American of American directors <coughs> with Independence Day, kind of becoming more American than any American ever was. Um, the new post-millennial cinema is kind of a reaction to this. And I see this as a, a cinema that embraces the diversification that is infused by uh, people migrating to Germany that becomes multicultural. Um, and it starts back up with the question of uh, historical negotiation, of seeing itself as part of German cinema history, um, of seeing itself uh, spread out over more, uh, um, more possibilities of making film. Uh, and good examples of this are, of course, the Berlin School, uh, which becomes more critical, again, of social realities, which kind of goes back to the idea of new German cinema. And, of course, the international brand itself is the heritage film, the ones that got two Oscars in the last couple of years. So whenever we talk about history, we're back in business with German films. And um, the quote here is by Paul Cook. 
In contradistinction to the failure abroad of German films in the 1990s, it would seem that today's filmmakers have at least at last found a way to be both German and international. The Heritage film is the one that uh, kind of makes the biggest impact and uh, here it actually becomes a key concept that whenever we're talking about something German and which has become successful, it's kind of connected to the idea of history. Um, so the most exciting examples, of course, the two Oscar winners down there. So whenever we talk about history, history is kind of the key feature for German film to deal with history. Um, Jennifer Kapczynski and Michael Richardson <coughs> actually point out that within current trends, there's two different approaches towards the history and how history is dealt with in film. One of them is the pastist, which takes historical, uh, which takes the history as kind of the most pressing element of the film. With this is dealing with history, um, Vergangenheitsbewältigung of Deutsch, which meaning you know really renegotiating history. So this deals with uh, historical dramas. Uh, who kind of present a counter-history or histories that might be forgotten, kind of presenting history as the key feature. Uh, documentary films like the Simler Project or even, and this is also a pastist uh, idea, the preservation and restoration of film classics. So by going into the archives and finding new material for Metropolis, we're kind of revisiting history here. On the other hand, pastist ideals or pastist, the pastist, no, Sorry, that was the past. This is the presentist uh, trend, which then does also deal with history, but kind of projects it. Um, the key s uh, feature is the present. History here is seen as something leading towards the present. So there is a more directional path here. There is uh, an influence which the history has and a, a place for history, but it needs to be negotiated within the present. So how do we now deal with what has happened before? Uh, and this, of course, very famous examples is on the one hand the multicultural uh, transnational cinema like Fatih Akin right here, uh, a Turkish-born director um, that now directs actually questions of how do Turkish immigrants deal with Germany and German culture, uh, as well as the Berlin School, the Innere Sicherheit, Christian Petzold, very famous for that. Um, so these are the, the trends of German cinema at the moment. But where is horror film in this? There's really no position to, pu to put it anywhere. And basically, whenever we're talking about horror film, this is what we're thinking of. <laughs> right, so whenever horror film in Germany is evoked, we see the image of Count Orlok rising from the grave. Because this is expressionism. Expressionism is the big element of horror film in Germany. But... Um, and this is Randall Hall here who says that horror film has been largely disregarded in terms of film studies and in terms of German film studies especially. And instead it should be a focus of inquiry because it is central to popular film. This is actually something that when we're talking about popular film, about popular culture, uh, popular genres like horror are very central. They make a big point. Um, Stefan Hanke <coughs> even goes further. He says not having horror film in German, in German film history is actually a rhetorical strategy. We don't want it in there when we're talking about film history. Um, he says this is because we don't want you know, continuity to go on and, and there's a whole deal of, of how to do this. The key here is we can actually gain from reinserting those films into German film history. We can gain insight from that. Um, so. One aspect where this has actually happened is Randall Hall has talked about the unification horror of the 19 period 1989 to 93. And he has said that in this period especially, but continuing actually after 1993, um, horror film production has become, um, there's a growth spurt here. Um, horror film become, uh, has become so important that it makes up to 5 to 6 percent of the total film production in Germany. I mean, from almost zero, from being so marginal that nobody notices, it kind of goes up to five or six percent. And I, I dare you to find me a good horror film of German horror film of the 1950s or 60s. It's really hard to find, depending on what you define as horror. Um, so this 
production actually leads to an increase by very young and talented new filmmakers who are usually self-taught, they're um, subculturally inclined, um, and they are very independent. So most of these productions are not high budget. They are just you know low budget splatter films. And this is actually interesting. They choose the horror genre of the splatter film from Hollywood fame, basically, and they insert into this um, different forms of uh, deviations, mostly sexual transgressions. So you will have films dealing with necrophilia, with sodomy. You will have films that go over good taste. These films are not good taste. And uh, since they are low budget as well, they are really you know, straining every now and then. Um, so these, and, and Hall's uh, um, idea here is that because of this uh, cinema of abjection, um, this is actually a representation of the social turmoil that has come with the insecurity and, 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 and the position of being unified and not having any idea where the future leads, where Germany is supposed to be positioned at this point. Um, so a very famous example is Sch uh, Christoph Schlingensief, who kind of had the idea of doing the German chainsaw massacre by saying that uh, West Germany is literally eating East Germany. So there's a, a translation going on here because of the, uh, of the horror film production. So but this, and this is a, an interesting reminder, this is the same time that we're talking about cinema of consensus, <laughs> right? So on the one hand, you have people doing pseudo-crisis, you know, I'm 20-something, who am I going to marry? Oh, I'm not going to marry, I'm going to go party. And on the other hand, you have people, you know, having sex with corpses and eating each other. Same period, say a completely different outlook on between mainstream and horror. And this is probably the most gruesome image that's in there. Uh, <laughs> um, but so this is, horror film is actually an element of turmoil, of anxiety within a society. We are always producing horror film in the moments that we feel insecure within society. This is an outlet basically for us. So the interesting aspect here is that within the 2000s, um, this anxiety and this turmoil has continued, even grown. We're talking about the war on terror. We're talking about a culture conflict between uh, um, Christianity and, and uh, Muslim religion. We are talking about financial crisis. We're talking about Europe becoming fortress Europe because there's refugees wanting to come in. So Germany, especially uh, as central part of the European identity, is continuously in this moment of anxiety. And I think for the 2000s, uh, the chaotic is kind of a default. So it kind of explains why there is more and more post-millennial horror film which I would argue is con still a critique of what is going on in contemporary society in Germany. There is a negotiation of what's happening. Um, but it is also uh, part of the globalized market. So we are looking for a transnational aesthetic. We are looking for more. Um, it is usually done within the presentist position. So we're not talking about a historical film about uh, about the Nazi past, but we're rather taking the Nazi past and making something in the present with it. Um, these films are very much aware of where they come from, both in terms of history, uh, of cinema history, but also in terms of genre history. These films are aware that in the 1980s, uh, um, the, the subcultural underground horror was there, and they use it, they make use of it. But they're also just as aware of new German cinema, for example, and its artistic experiments, its uh, uh, avant-garde uh, aesthetics. So um, I would see this as an infusion of um, transnational appeal and transnational genres within the sense of German movie making. And I do not have a time here, so I do have no idea how fast I'm going. <laughs> oh, <laughs> obviously, yes, never look up. Uh, <laughs> so um, before I go into the, my final example, I have a couple of them. Uh, don't worry, I took two out, so you don't have to watch uh, to go over all six of them. Um, one such example, and one of the first films to do this, is actually is an Anatomy by Stefan Rusevitsky, which takes up the generic formula of the medical thriller, combines it, like 
coma by Michael Crichton, for example, and combines it with the teen slasher film. So the idea is basically it plays at a medical college uh, and there's a mass murderer wielding a scalpel killing off students. But the film is not just that. Um, it also links its, its history and its, its uh, story to um, German history and German culture in the present. On the one hand, by using uh, Gunther von Hagen's um, Body Worlds exhibit and also linking it to uh, an old society, a secret society that has been active since before the Nazi time. So on the one hand, the film links this to uh, Nazi ideology. It's the talk of Josef Mengele, of experimentation on, on people, on eugenics. And this is continued onwards towards uh, an ideal like the body walls, um, where inappropriate or possibly inappropriate experimentation is still going on. And the film kind of interconnects all of these elements in order for us to see a historical path of where uh, um, aspects of Nazi history kind of has led us. And it connects this to, and this is very interesting to see, um, universities and um, medical practices in science um, and how we still have a very patriarchal and experimental and non-moral code here. Um, so this is the, the idea of the historical trajectory that the film makes up. Another example in a very different note is Dead in Three Days, and yes, this is actually a, a title, Dead in Three Days 2, which is the sequel from uh, 2008 towards the film from 2006. Um, on the one hand, what the film does, it injects Germanness by using, well, in this case, not Germanness, but Austrianness, by injecting an Austrian dialect into the film, very pronounced, which makes it a very jarring moment when you're expecting Hollywood conventions uh, and you're seeing a teen slasher film and it starts with Austrian dialect, rural dialect. Um, so the slasher film, uh, classic like Halloween, stuff like that, is transported uh, towards the very peaceful rural Alpine community. Um, so what international audiences would connect to the sound of music here becomes kind of a deconstruction of this Austrian rural image uh, into something very backwoodsy, debased, even claustrophobic in its, in its mentality. Um, part one actually is very normal in terms of genre. It still plays out as a normal teen slasher, high school students getting killed. <laughs> um, and there's a final girl, and that's the final girl. But in part two, this final girl sees herself again in a situation where she's threatened. And the film kind of makes a reversal and puts her into a rape revenge fantasy where she is actually the one killing off the backwoodsy family that has been snacking on other people uh, as in terms of cannibalistic horror. So uh, you, you take something like The Hills Have Eyes and then inject uh, Jamie Lee Curtis from Halloween into that and kill off everybody in The Hills Have Eyes. So this is kind of how this film works. Um, so there's a complete turnaround of the, of the generic conventions and a, and a playing with that. Um, another example is Marvin Krenz's uh, 2010 film Rambok, or Berlin Undead, which basically is a zombie treatment. But the film owes as much to Day of the Dead as it does to Rear Window. So here, the zombie apocalypse is concentrated <coughs> into one apartment complex in Berlin, which has a closed-off courtyard. And people are always watching each other over the courtyard. Um, and this film actually completely refuses any of the generic conventions which would call for blood and gore and people getting ripped apart. None of that happens. All of this is rather done in kind of a comment on how people act in close quarter living. Um, it's very anonymous, nobody knows each other really well, and they're all kind of suspecting the other f of being uh, possibly a, a, a zombie. Um, so this is kind of staged as a chamber piece. Um, and there's very little horror effects, uh, and instead it's very beautifully, uh, there's very beautiful photography going on here, or cinematography. Beautiful uh, uh, film for that. So very intense and kind of completely ignoring genre conventions. 
And lastly, Andy Fletcher's The Depraved from 2011, um, which on the one hand starts off as kind of an underground exploration. People, you know, a couple of students sneak into the underground of Berlin. Uh, they're seeking a Nazi bunker, which has been kind of not really discovered and, and opened up, but they're kind of seeking this. And this obviously is an exploitation of the gruesome Nazi history for cheap thrills, touristic thrills. So this is one of the comments that the film makes. The film actually uses a lot of conventions, you know, scary tunnels, uh, deadly drops, decay, and the occasional neo-Nazi thug with his uh, pit bull that comes up at some point. All of this wouldn't really be that interesting if the film didn't turn around and kind of make this a torture porn, like Hostel. And kind of, um, the group gets captured by uh, a sh an old Stasi border patrol officer who is mad as a hatter and thinks that the group is actually um, threatening kind of an insurgency threat towards the old regime and he starts torturing them, eating them, and, and the, the people have to escape. So there's kind of this, um, all of this only makes sense because he's an old GDR border patrol. And in Berlin, there's a, an unresolved tension between the history of the GDR and Berlin becoming this on the move city of international success. So there's this old history that's still there. And I mean, uh, Nost Ostalgie actually expresses that, but it's never resolved. And the film actually opens up this tension by saying there is still this history and this is what's gonna get you. Uh, <laughs> so my prime example though, is going to be hell. Um, and I think I might actually need to hurry up a little bit. For me, this is the perfect mixture um, of tradition and convention. So on the one hand, we do have very generic Hollywood conventions. The film starts off as an apocalyptic road movie and then kind of moves over towards the backwoods slasher, the cannibal horror film. So in the first part, uh, the basic premise is in 2016, um, solar flares have scorched the earth, nothing can live anymore, um, all plants and animals die, everything is kind of hell, bright, right? Because the earth, uh, uh, everything is kind of, the sun is scorching everything away. Um, so three survivors, Marie, her sister Leonie, and her boyfriend Philip, make their way towards the Bavarian mountains because in the mountains there might be water. So far, so good. Um, at some point, they get, a, they get kind of um, into this... Um, they're being set up uh, and captured um, by this family that uh, only survives on snacking on other people because that's the only food that's around. So it kind of turns into this uh, cannibal horror film. So far, all of this, whenever I'm saying this the synopsis, sounds completely gener generally Hollywood genre horror. But the film is nonetheless um, very much rooted in German history on the one hand, it makes this clear by using a cast which is German, German traditional and transnational. Um, in contrast to other ho underground horror films, this film actually seeks th the best of both worlds. And one critic actually commented, the film is both a genre shocker and a real actor's drama. Um, you can see this by Hannah Herzsprung and Stipe Erczek, who are both um, had had lead roles in German productions, but have also kind of um, had supporting roles in international movies like The Reader. So um, they might actually be known to international audiences. On the other hand, Lars Eidinger and Angela Winkler are renowned stage actors from one of the best stages that Germany has, uh, the, the Schaubühne. And Angela Winkler might actually be recognizable here um, is an actress from the new German cinema. She is Katharina Blum of Volker Schlöndorf's Katharina Blum. She is the mother of us Oskar Mazerat in Tindrum. So there is a, a strong connection in choosing her as a cast. Um, in addition, Germanness is also marked by um, very regional elements. For example, um, the locations in the first part of the film are the German Tankstelle and the German Autobahn, right? This is where it happens. Um, all over the place you can see German license plates, you can see German brands being picked out. Uh, um, Marie at one point picks up a Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, and at one point in the film, 
um, Leonie actually picks up a CD and puts it, in uh, puts it into the CD player and it plays 99 Red Balloons by Nina, which is on the one hand a nice comment on the 1980s and the theme of the song, which connects to the theme of the film, which is destruction of Earth because of what humans do. Um, so the, the bleak apocalyptic feeling of the song gets transported into the film. On the other hand though, this is probably the, mon the one song that international audiences will recognize as German. Because it's the, the biggest success that German pop history has brought out in, international, in terms of international success. Further, the film also comments on Germanness because it uses two uh, very historically um, charged um, locations, which is the German forest and the German Bauernhof. And I'm going to explain those a little bit in detail because there's a lot of history going on here which the film uses and makes a uh, very explicit use of. So on the one hand, and this is basically where I see the presentist agenda in this film, because it, it actually even it's a, a futurist agenda, if you will, because it's 2016, five years into the future of the film. Um, the German forest is in itself for Germany and has always been a national symbol. The German forest is kind of this ideal of German identity. This is where we are German. So um, it is in the film though not just evoked but also deconstructed. It is kind of resonating with a lot of images from the past which kind of are in the present because of the scorched forest that they're, they're in. So Jeffrey Wilson here says the German forest is actually the metaphor for the nation itself. Uh, this is what makes Germany German. You can see this historically in, for example, um, Roman mythology where um, Germans were said to be born from tree spirits and hiding in the trees and kind of being with the trees because they're so connected to it. And you can also see it in Waldeinsamkeit, which is a romantic ideal of being with nature, being akin to nature, being kind of... Um, the, the forest is always a source of safety. It is a source uh, that can give you shelter from uh, um, armies, it can provide resources. So in itself it becomes kind of the symbol of national identity and of nature itself. Um, this actually goes so far that in Turkish ideology, which means uh, ethnic ideology, um, the German tribe is the land. The German tribe is the forest. Um, this is where the ideas of the eternal German forest come from, of an eternal tribe that kind of produces itself uh, and the German forest becomes a metaphor of structure for society itself with all parts kind of being together. But it also resonates with the idea of Waldsterben, which is something that happens in the 1980s. And this is especially resonant with the film because of the images of the film. In the 1980s, there was a huge discussion in Germany about national identity because we were losing our forests to ecological disaster. So very important also you see images like these. These are resonant with the idea of how German culture, society, is represented in the German forest. So by destroying the German forest here, by having a, a completely denuded forest, the film actually makes the point that society is gone. So whenever a, a post-apocalyptic film usually presents society as being gone, there's a lot of things going on like people uh, uh, hurting each other, raping each other, whatever, to, to get uh, uh, the point across. Here, just the image of the forest can get that point across because if there's no forest, there's no Germany. Um, another and even more remarked image is the German Bauernhof. In English, this would be the farmstead, but there's a different connotation to what a Bauernhof is because a farmstead is actually something uh, in, in American mythology that's wrought from the frontier. You actually go out and claim it from wild lands. In Germany this is very different and I'm going to explain why. Um, on the one hand, at the moment, and this is very interesting, the film uses the Bauernhof as its element of horror. Um, it takes a Bavarian family of peasants and makes them the cannibals. Um, Robin Wood says about horror that it is usually a sublimation of something that is deeply repressed within society. So by using the horror, uh, the horror and putting it into the Bauernhof, something's off with how we get to this rural thing. 
Um, today, the Bauernhof, and these are the images that you can find on the internet in masses, um, Germany idolizes the rural. There's a, a whole movement back towards the idea of the rural because the rural represents um, a simple life, a perfect life. Kind of very friendly, it's nurturing. This is where we are, this is where we belong. This is, you know, going back to the country. Of course, this is hyper real. This is a picture perfect image. Um, this picture perfect image has actually been done a lot over the time. In the 1950s, um, the Heimat film, the Homeland film, is actually exactly this kind of idyllic representation of fantasy of a simpler life. So, by projecting this in the 1950s, one could actually give German audiences the idea of the Nazi past never happened. You don't have to worry about this. Worry about rural life and how it is all so perfect and easy. Of course, this even transports onto today uh, where a TV series like the Schwarzwald Klinik or the Berg Doctor still exist. Same thing, right? It's the rural idolization. Obviously, this was a bit critical in the 1970s. The new German cinema had the idea that maybe this is not just as, as, as perfect and ideal. Maybe this is just a veneer. Maybe this is all decayed and problematic and we're not dealing with our past and we should. So, um, Jagdszenen aus Niederbayern, uh, um, hunting scenes from Bavaria, is actually a film in which a village destroys nonconformity by hunting down uh, a supposed homosexual and a promiscuous maid. They're really hunted, as in the scene right here. Interestingly, the maid that is being hunted is played by Angela Winkler, who is now, in the new film, um, the mother of the peasant clan that is cannibalistic. So there's a long trajectory here which we can see. But all of this kind of goes back to the idea of where the German Bauernhof comes from. And the German Bauernhof is not me going out to the West claiming my territory. The German Bauernhof is deeply entrenched into the blood and soil ideology of the Nazis. The idea here was and, um, that because of its, uh, um, the difference he, uh, Walter de Rehm makes up is between peasantry being born for farming and agriculture using farming actually just to make profit. So the idea here was to give the peasants who are dealing with the land, this land as their own. Um, and this has been the case since um, the, the feudal land reforms. Uh, peasants who worked the land were the owners of the land and became part of the land. So this is a very long standing tradition of peasants actually being the backbone of the country. This is where all of this comes from. And blood and soil actually also means that um, they would have to look in terms of lineage. You would have to look for pure lineage. And the tribe would go over everything else. The tribe would be the most important thing there is. Um, you could actually even support your tribe and ignore everybody else out there. So the film uses all of this uh, and making a commentary by using this burnt down image of the Bauernhof. So in hell, there's a kind of a, a, a historical projection that's going on here because all of these images, the, the ideal of the nurturing, the historical that, that kind of brings in the German tradition, um, all of this is kind of grotesquely turned upside down because the family is not nurturing but cannibalistic. They're actually eating up other people. Um, so the horror is here evoked in the ideal of the origin, uh, or the ideal of this and the origin in history and the trajectory it takes. Um, racial purity, tribal connection, all of this comes through. And I do have kind of a commentary that they're going in here, um, and Marie, and they're all seeking this out because they think of the idyllic, of the nurturing uh, projection. They're thinking of the hyper-real image here. So, Thank you. 
주시는 그런 믿음을 많이 드리게 하자. 전 바라니까 이제 저를 모르게 하자. 근데 나는 바이안이 쓰는 수 없어. 이게 플로우리. 그러니까 그런 수 없어. 그것도 이런 하이트의 방미야. So the, the premise of the film is basically that whenever materialist problems come up, we return to this ideal of the tribe. We go back to saving our own, and no matter what. Um, what is interesting here is that the film reveals this in a very uh, intense scene, um, which on the one hand reveals that the mother um, is obviously not the caring type, but, <laughs> but kind of uh, easily uh, uh, you know, would, would kill someone, eat them, and kind of take care of her own tribe. But on the other hand, this is also a very important scene. There we go. No, too early. Doesn't matter. Um, this is also a scene in which the film kind of rejects Hollywood expectations. Because as you've seen in the, in the scene, there's no action going on here. All of this is very low key. All of this is just people talking. And the horror doesn't come in because you see bodies being chopped up. The horror is seeing her so calm and so rational about keeping her tribe alive that she suggests eating someone. And all of this is very, very subtle, uh, which of course is a complete rejection of the stereotypes of the mad cannibal. Uh, if you're thinking of Toby Hooper and the uh, Chainsaw Massacre, there's a completely different image here. And the film does this with all of its stereotypes. The final girl, or the, the um, actually the dumb, brutal redneck, the, the boy that she's supposed to marry, he's not dumb, brutal redneck, he's actually very shy. He plays with his little brother and he can't even look her in the eye. He's so uh, um, non-typical. Marie, on the other hand, as a final girl, yes, she is a final girl because she's very practical. But on the other hand, she uses her sexuality freely and openly to uh, get wherever she needs to go, which is uh, a no-go for a final girl. Um, actually, the film is very in intense in that case um, because it completely um, focuses on female perspectives. It refuses the male gaze, and it does so even more um, by refusing all of the blood and gore spectacle. Just as Marvin Krenn's zombie narrative, this film does not project, you, you don't see anybody getting slaughtered. There is no blood splatter here. There is the, uh, the complete film, the only violence, uh, one critic actually remarked, the only blood you'll ever see here is a few drops of menstrual blood. That's the only blood that the film actually uses. The only violent image is uh, the scene when uh, all of the cattle escapes. Um, but other than that, th this is the film completely refuses this and kind of goes with the horror projected into the human interaction. The horror is the ideal that's behind all of this. So to sum up, and I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, the new German horror film is not underground anymore. It kind of has opened up towards mainstream. It finds itself in this position of being both political and entertaining. It's finding a larger audience, but it's also still true to what it, where it came from. Uh, it's true to the subversive elements of social critique. It's um, very aware of its heritage, both in terms of cinematic history going back to expressionism for certain uh, images of black and white, for the very expressionist images of the, <coughs> the movie here. Um, it also goes back towards the, the other horror film in, in terms of uh, uh, German history, film history, it goes back to new German cinema. So it's very rooted in, the, in, in all of these discourses, but it's also very in the present, so it's a presentist dis dis perspective. History is something that is projected into the present. Um, and as such, I would say it, it takes generic convention of Hollywood, it uses them, it exploits them, but it also makes clear that there's innovation in, in terms of Germanness in there. You can inject something German into Hollywood and still make it work. Um, so my conclusion would be that the German horror film is both 
German enough for us to warrant our critique and our, our discussion of it. And it's not too German to reject us as an audience and just enjoy the film. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope this worked out. <laughs> I'll just jump in and start. Uh, so, so until hell, what I had the impression you were arguing was that horror, because the, because the sort of default reference is back to expressionism, that expressionism as the way to the NS period, the ever problematic NS period, oh. horror used instead a, a reference to the Hollywood genre. That was a kind of circumvention. Rather than tackle the, all the, the NS period stuff, Expressionism just used a different reference and played with the conventions of Hollywood horror. That sounded like what a lot of the films did. The 1980s and 90s, yeah. or? But what I didn't see them doing is going back to 19th century, what you call the, the kinds of horror that, that German romanticism evokes. Um, that's, that seemed not to be there until hell, and then it comes out of the well, it is, it is actually also in there in, in something like uh, in three days, uh, th Dead in Three Days, which plays in the rural uh, um, Austrian Alps, and it's also this idea of this, um, it's called a, a, a Joch Bauernhof, which is all the way up in the Alps, and it's kind of like this, uh, um, um, I don't even know how to describe that, but it's, it's kind of this farming uh, um, husbandry, uh, animal husbandry farm. So there's a lot of uh, very rural images that go on with that. Uh, so, so I guess my question, why, it seems to me that the, the 19th century stuff is such a rich site of it's the horror, it's the, it's the strategies that drive expressions in that way, that whole notion of externalizing things, mm -hmm. of nature bearing the brunt of the spirit, of all that kind of anxiety, not so much played out through actors as through the space. That's such a rich site for the horror. Why even bother with the Hollywood, why even bother to play with Hollywood genres? Why did that become the, the manifestation of the horrific? Um, I wouldn't say the manifestation of the horrific is the Hollywood genre, but the manifestation of the horrific is kind of the unfamiliarity of our history. Um, Stefan Hanke argues that uh, Stefan A. Hanke argues that our history has kind of become so familiar to us in Germany. You know, we're we're dealing with the Nazi period all over the place. Uh, you can't go to German school and not get it at least in I don't know five or six different grades. So we're drenched in German history all the time. I mean, at the moment, obviously, 25 years uh, um, uh, uh, dissolution of the Mauer. Um, all of that is kind of all over the place. But it's become so familiar to us that we're kind of jaded to it. It's just, yeah, yeah it's history. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, the Nazis did this. I mean, every German schoolboy has visited at least one N NS camp at some point in some kind of school project. Um, Hanke argues that we need these kind of horror films to kind of give us the unfamiliar view to do the unheimlich, right, the uncanny, to kind of reconceptualize it from a perspective that we've not seen and thought about. And with, this is what hell does. Right? It, it kind of takes the blood and soil idea, which we've all internalized by saying, oh, it's, it's so nice in the German Bauernhof, this is where Germany comes from. And it kind of puts it back in there and kind of makes this point of, you know, if you really think about this, this means that you're gonna eat everybody else before you eat your tribe. <laughs> Very dramatic. But I, I think the, the um, one aspect might be why the 19th century isn't that prominent is because in the expressionism, 19th century was just one element that kind of got into imagery uh, as that. And I could argue with Edgar Allan Poe, uh, terror is not of Germany, it's of the soul. So the more problematic here is not the, the, um, the German 19th century ideal, but the more problematic here is actually the, the element of the psychological, how is the German psyche made up? And uh, 1989, 1990s horror film, the, the unification horror, kind of exposes that, this decay that's in the German psyche. And this is where this goes back to, right? This is the, the film actually exploits not images of horror of Germany, but it exploits ideas that are behind this and very subtly kind of puts it into perspective. And I, I would like to ask a question. Thank you, this was really interesting. Um, and I'm curious about reception. Uh, so you mentioned a critic sort of towards, very close towards the end, um, but what is the reception history of these films? Are they recognized as a genre, a kind of post-millennial German horror film? Are they received as such? Are they, how are they reviewed? Do people like them? What's the box office like? Kind of 
what is it like as a genre received by the German public, and what does that tell us about kind of, kind of people working through these issues that you so nicely read these films to tell us about? Well, I'll go back to the beginning, so. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's uh, one slide which, no, you're supposed to go back to home. <laughs> There's one image right here, obviously. Um, reception is actually very different on some of these films. There are actually still underground films being produced which are very schlocky and horror and gory. Um, films like Anatomy or Antikörper actually are uh, internationally even. Um, Anatomy has actually been, uh, been released in the US, I think. Uh, not sure how good, well it fared over here. Um, Anatomy and Antikörper, these films are actually pretty well established. Um, films like Rambok or Urban Explorer or Hell have been received critically as very well done and, and kind of producing a new, uh, a new standard for horror films. Um, they haven't really done that well in terms of, you know, they, they can't compare to De Bevigte Mann, for example, right? There's, you know, there's still the, the comedy which kind of draws in millions and then there's smaller films. But in terms of, of genre film, if you compare the numbers of these films to the numbers of the 1990s of Das Deutsche Kettensägen Massaker, it's uh, this is much much more of what this is being where this is being received. Uh, and I, I found it very interesting. Hell has actually received critical attention by both Spiegel and Süddeutsche, which are two of the most important feuilletons in terms of you know uh, are the, are journalisms uh, that that deal with cu critical uh, cultural criticism. So there is a recognition of that. Uh, the films have actually produced, uh, um, Hell has actually garnered a couple of awards. Um, I've, I, I mentioned, or I, it was used to be on this slide, but I kind of cut it out. Uh, they actually got a Bavarian Film Prize, a German Film Prize for Best Debut, that kind of stuff. So there is uh, a quite a bit of attention. I'm hoping that in bringing this to you at some point, maybe we can work on getting these films out there for, for international audiences because they're really, you know, a film like this is, is worth watching if you're into horror film. Um, this is something you should see uh, because it's done very, very well. Uh, and the photography or the cinematography is amazing. Maybe I can just quickly add to that. Uh, Hell was actually shown at the Berlinale uh, a couple of years ago and, and I was at, at the, the, the screening but it was not positioned as a horror film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it starts off kind of with a comparison. Actually, one of the one of the critics mentioned that this film was shown at Cannes uh, in, in one of the Ancien Regard uh, um, uh, film series, and it holds its own against. The, I think that was his term. It holds its own against uh, Hollywood con films like The Road, which deals with a similar topic. Or if you're looking at a film like Book of Eli, this one's a lot better. I mean, Denzel Washington, yes, no, whatever, but this one is much more interesting in terms of, of film. Um, so it, it does hold its own, um, both in terms of science fiction and in terms of an apocalyptic, but I think it's more interesting in terms of horror because of the second part of the film. And do, like, in, in films like critics, like in, in newspapers, writing, they say, like, this is about blood and soil and it's about the, this kind of, like, Nazi past, or, or is that not? Um, no, but um, the problem with, with film criticism here is uh, that, of course, they're first of all, they're, they're concentrating on the fact that it's a debut film from someone. They're concentrating on the fact that uh, this is a, uh, one of the few German horror films that kind of really stands out and makes this genre in Germany something special. Because, like I said, the, the narrative usually goes, <coughs> Germany doesn't produce horror films. We just don't do this. So this is where the, most of this goes. Uh, one critic actually talks in detail about Roland Emmerich being the producer. So he's the executive producer. He brought in some international money. He got Paramount to sign off on the deal. So it is internationalized. Um, but you no, know, of course, uh, going this deep into the, the German forest and the blood and soil, that's my doing. <laughs> but I think, the, I think the, the film still holds up to this. I think that it's in there. Um, so. And I'm, if, I, if I can manage to get a paper out of this one, then at some point some critic will have said it. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a comment. <coughs> uh, 
uh, comment first. You know, uh, there are other genres that deliver social critique and the subversive genre. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a comment, not a question, because I'm thinking out loud. So what is specific about horror films um, that deliver those critiques more entertaining? So I was thinking about uh, the entertaining value of horror. That's that's just um, okay. a very impressionistic um, um, observation. And my question um, is the treatment of horror as a medium for films, vis-a-vis -vis the treatment of horror uh, as a medium for TV drama. OK. Um, the, so the, is it, okay. I'm thinking about the American uh, TV drama, like The Walking Dead. So I'm just wondering yeah. whether, yeah. whether aesthetically uh, the treatment of horror uh, is similar or different. Um, well, f f first of the question of, or the, the comment on, of course, other films socially critique. Um, actually, I think you can make the same argument for the German science fiction film, which has kind of picked up over the last couple of years. There are some really good examples. Um, very underground, most, of, most people don't know about these films, but there are a few, not as many as in horror, but there are a few science fiction films. There's also um, one film that got a lot of critical attention, which is uh, a neo-Western. So there is, uh, um, it deals with an Austrian uh, very far off uh, um, uh, valley in the 19th century, I think. And so it, it has become kind of this neo-Western, uh, um, also very critical of, of today. So I think you can make this argument for more genres, if you want. Genres that have usually been ignored in Germany. Um, in terms of what we like about horror, I think I would actually go back to Noel Carroll with that one on, and say, uh, this is art horror. This is us having a lot of fun about something we do never, ever want to experience in real life. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm just you know, out on a limb there. That, that's, I think, what, what this is about, the, uh, the sublimation of something we, we don't know how to deal otherwise with. Um, in terms of how it deals with um, other visual formats, um, I think it's the other way around. I think nowadays television has kind of picked up on the aesthetics of uh, film. So nowadays TV series are produced with a standard in mind and a high, uh, a high concept of narrativity that actually we, we, we were used from film that wasn't in TV series. I don't think there is a good horror film. Well, I think it's, it's, it's more difficult to make a horror TV drama sustain the interest of the audience because part of the <laughs> horror is, is shock, <laughs> right? You, you, it's, it's the replay of the same formula. So I always wonder why, what was why a TV series um, horror would last for more than one or two seasons. There's, there's, I, I know of two very good horror film series. One of them is American Horror Story, which circumvents this by doing a completely different season every season. They have a completely different storyline every season, so they do not have to worry about this. Uh, and the other one is The Walking Dead, which in itself is serial because the zombie is serial. The zombie kind of reproduces itself over and over and over again, so coming to back to the same s serial narrative doesn't really problematize things in a series like The Walking Dead. But I would agree, you do not really make a TV series about a vampire, which is why NBC's Dracula tanked after the first series, the first well, season. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, of course, but that's... Um, but, but, um, but Buffy is actually one of exactly the, the problems. The, the longer you watch Buffy, uh, the more it becomes stale and repetitive, and it just keeps on going the same. I mean, there is even the joke within Buffy, see, she saved the world a lot. Because she keeps doing and doing and doing the same thing all over again. True Blood is actually, I wouldn't actually say True Blood is about the vampires, but True Blood is about otherness. Uh, True Blood is about sexuality, it's about race. It's not a commentary on the vampire that much. So I'd, I wouldn't really see the horror aspect as being new and innovative, but the drama part of it as being new and innovative. Um, I just wanted to come back and actually, uh, Catherine, um, start getting at um, how are these films um, marketed in Germany, and who are they marketed to? And you kind of saying, oh, you know, a lot of it was underground. Now it's not anymore. Like, who, like, who are they? You know, kind of. You know, <laughs> well, who's the recipient intended for this? 
um, these, um, I think the idea is to take the horror film fans, mm -hmm. those that actually would, if you're going to watch uh, Halloween, what is it now, 27? <laughs> uh, you know, if you're going to watch A Nightmare on Elm Street, you're a fan for one of these films as well. That's kind of the idea basically where they start from. Uh, films like Anatomy and Antikörper, because of the, the, the people, or Tattoo even, because of the people that are in them, uh, the, the actors and the kind of marketing, they're going for more like the mainstream, um, towards the mainstream action audience. So anyone actually can watch these films as long as you're a fan of blockbusters. Yeah. Uh, you can, yeah, for, for films like Anatomy, you can actually uh, see a, a billboard up and stuff like that. Um, for a film like uh, In Drei Tagen bis zu Tod or Blutgletscher, um, you're not going to find those marketed that big. But because of the, uh, they're doing the, the, the film festival circuit, because they're, they're being constantly talked about on, on blogs and, and websites like movie pilots and that stuff, there's a lot of uh, uh, attention going on in the internet because of that. And so they are getting a bigger audience than just the underground. In some, um, I, th I think especially Ramburg might probably deal with this in terms of the, the urban center. Um, otherness is really kind of uh, um, not that much of an issue in terms of race. For example, if um, there is actually very little crossover with the Turkish uh, uh, cinema producers, which is I find very interesting because um, they're dealing mostly still with um, genre, generic conventions of a cinema of consensus, so with comedy, dealing with the question of how do I, as a, as a Turkish immigrant, deal with Germany, I do it with comedy, right? I, I make fun of it, kind of. Um, so there is not really, uh, uh, f I would actually love to see Fatih Akim produce a horror film. That would be very interesting to see. I hope he does it at some point. Um, you do have a little bit of it in Ramburg, for example, which is an urban center, and there is, uh, a little bit of a discussion on that, but not very much, no. Um, these films, if they produce otherness, they produce it rather in their own group by, for example, um, the Austrian rural. So there's uh, someone from Vienna, very cultured, who moves into the rural parts and is kind of seen as the other and sees the others, or the, the rural citizens, the peasants, as something completely odd and different. Um, but yeah, there is a potential here. There's a, a huge potential here for term, in terms of feminism, in terms of racial otherness. Um, there's more which the films can do. Um, but actually, most generic Hollywood conventions don't do that either. They're still very, uh, um, very much driven by the final girl uh, 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 male gaze idea a lot. A lot of them are. Um, so there, there's actually a lot of potential which can go into this. Um, Yes. Hi, my name is Jeff Ravel. Um, thank you for an interesting talk on uh, German film studies and their relation to post-millennial German identity. I, I wanted to ask you a question not directly related to your talk, but related to your candidacy here. Mm -hmm. um, what is your understanding of German studies and what role does film studies play in the category of German studies? Mm -hmm. Um, it's actually one part of the talk that I cut out because I was, when I first timed it, it was like over an hour, so I was like, nah, I can't do. Um, I, I started out with the, with the idea of uh, determining or explaining how German film studies fits into German studies um, and how it fits into film studies because both are actually important for, for German film studies. And in German studies, I think there's a, a, a trend towards the film as our students are actually interested in it. Um, there's a lot of uh, especially contemporary work which is done 
um, much more recently because of film. So the, uh, contemporary topics like, for example, migration are dealt with in films like this or uh, um, globalization is dealt with in films of the new of Berlin School, for example. So there's, uh, I think in German studies, film is becoming an, an ever growing and ever more interesting topic. The problem is rather in film studies, which I've shortly commented on, where German film is usually just used for expressionism and maybe new German cinema. But there's very little in between those two categories which film studies deals with. And I mean, there is also, um, of course, uh, German film theory and film criticism, which is actually uh, flourishing at the moment. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, a criticism produced on horror films, for example. Not necessarily on German horror films, but on horror films in general. There's a lot of, uh, um, and I've, for in terms of my candidacy, I'm, I'm uh, the founding member of the uh, um, Association for Research and the Fantastic. And we do have in the GFF and the ZFF, the journal that the, mag the Institute gives out, um, there is a lot of uh, um, research going on into film from Germany, which could broaden the horizon of German film studies and which could broaden the horizon of film studies in general. So I think there is a lot of potential there to, to be used and to be, to be done, and especially in terms of teaching, because uh, talking to the students just uh, an hour before, they're interested in film, because film is, is for them something very easily accessible. Of course, there's the, 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 first, uh, the, the first answer they give why they like film is because they don't have to write and read. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, um, I think this is true for, for, for a lot of people, and this is, I've, I've said this over the day a couple of times. I like to pick up students where they are. And our, th this generation is probably more avid film on, and TV and video games, so much more visual than they are textual. So I, I think it's a, it's a chance for us to, to bring them German culture if we include these kinds of topics. Um, thank you for your talk, it was really enjoyable. I have a question that's kind of related to the one that came uh, a minute ago. And that is, um, your, your main question is, how German or transnational are these German horror films? And my question is, do you see that um, film as a visual medium and horror films in particular raise this question, say, more than text. Um, why, why would you use film, and this is an open-ended question, but why would you use film to um, ask this question? Why does film provide an answer to this question, which, uh, I mean, would this question arise if you're looking at, say, I mean, at, at a novel? I think you can also, uh, of course, you can, you can extend that to, to other formats. And yes, a novel would also address this. Um, film is, I think, especially potent for that because of the, the double contextualization. You have the content, you have the, the topic that the film deals with, but the, the forest, for example, here is never really addressed as being problematic or, or g provoking any kind of... Uh, um, connotation except for the one that we have aesthetically with it. So this com even if you were to, to deal with this in a novel, just evoking the imagery of a, a scorched, uh, um, and you've seen the images of the Waldstab and the images of in the film. Um, actually, the team had to, to uh, um, go to Corsica, where there had been a recent uh, wood fire in order for them to film these scenes because there was no other place where you could really film them this way. So I think um, the visual component of it is very evocative of associations and not uh, textual analysis. I mean, of course you can do the same thing with text, but I think for me especially um, the idea of the visual is something that is very uh, deeply emotionally evocative and it kind of brings out connotations that text doesn't that much uh, because of its visual aesthetic uh, uh, analysis. I'm not so you would say that if I say the German forest, or if I read a novel about the German forest, it wouldn't raise the question of nationality versus transnational in such a way? And then also, how would questions of transnationality and Germanness play into a context where media is moving to TV? Uh, as far as I know, a lot of the, the critics in Berlin are writing about television series and what they're super excited about are American uh, television series. Yeah. Whether it's Breaking 
I mean, yeah, this is actually a problem of, of film studies and, and uh, screen studies in Germany uh, is their focus on American product because it's very dominant. So um, finding an expert for the Italian horror film uh, of Fulci is, is probably a lot harder than finding someone who's dealing with True Blood. Right? So obviously because there's a very dominant, I mean, you can talk about cultural dominance of American products here. So I think that's why you're getting, you know, even Berlin critics uh, um, talking about this, this kind of thing. But I think one thing that the, the novel that we might consider when talking about the novel and raising questions of transnationality is that the novel market is, it needs a translation. It needs a publishing house that pays a lot of money to translate into, a, in, into an international uh, uh, English available book, which is not usually done. Whereas the film, is if it's transnationally produced with transnational or with international money and financing, is always already kind of aiming at the possibility of being internationally distributed. So there's uh, because of the production uh, um, side of things, I think the book doesn't raise that question not because of its topicality but because of its mediality. We have a lot more issues to deal with when we're dealing with transnational books because we have to deal with uh, other kind of publishing uh, systems. Um, there is a lot of American stuff being translated into German and published in Germany, but the other way around is really, really hard. I mean, if you're thinking of someone uh, in terms of the fantastic, I can, I can discuss this because I've discussed it with a lot of authors. Uh, Cornelia Funke is one of the few German fantastic authors who's been translated because she translated it herself, because she paid for the translation, because no publisher wanted to, to take the risk before she didn't take the risk first. So I think this is a, a more a question of mediality. Well, as you put it, it's almost a question of production. Yeah. Uh, rather than mediality. Well, because the medium itself is differently produced, let's put it this way, yeah. Yeah, um, I have a quick question. Um, just, uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, I just went back, I wanted to go back to your brief mention of criticism on horror films. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, um, whether whether you have plans to turn this project, which is this far descriptive, uh, into a critical project, um, and which direction would you would you choose to go? Just we talked, yeah, yeah. We talked a little bit it's about my, it in the. It's, it's my professional reflex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we we did talk a little bit about it when we talked the the half hour we had in, in uh, with the committee. We talked a little bit about historiography and the question of. How is the fantastic film, talking about genres like science fiction, horror, uh, and, and the fantasy, uh, there's very, very little fantasy in Germany, except from the fairy tale film. So how does that play into the, hist the history of cinema? And I've actually done a cursory review, I've, I've, like I've said before, I've had two stacks of, of books on German film on my desk, and I've gone through all of them, and except for like one or two little mentions or a, sh a short chapter, 19% of this never mentions the fantastic or the genre film. If you're, if you're looking at Sabine Harkes' work, if you're looking at Randall, um, well, Randall Hall is probably the only one that really does it, but if you're looking at, at uh, Eric Rentschler, if you're looking at Paul Cook, they all only, if ever, mention it in passing. Sometimes they say it's because it doesn't have enough room in here, sometimes they don't even know about it, but the, 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 the narrative is the same. It's just not part of what is canonical history. And I think it, it would be an interesting project, actually, to go back, back to expressionism and write a new history of German film for these genres and how they interact with yeah. but film. My question is, how do you turn it into a critical project? Yeah, I mean, if I could follow up on that. I mean, yeah, it's, sort of, it's, sort of, it's sort of my question, yeah. too, uh, just trying to get a, a bigger picture of sort of how you want. And it's related to sort of Jeff's question and other comments earlier, too. So sort of how, how do you position your scholarship and the kind of change you're trying to make? I mean, so part of it is that, right, that you've ignored f horror film, but horror film is really important. Okay, that's good. But if we take horror film seriously, sort of what changes? Like what, what transformation in the way we approach the field, or rather than just saying, oh, there's horror film, and then we can find some other films that have been ignored. You, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's okay, but, is there some way it changes our thinking about what we thought we knew about German studies or film studies or, and if so, 
what changes through your work? Or what would you like to change through your work? It's a big question. It's a big question, but it is that kind of what's the, so Jing calls it critical, what's the critical angle, thinking about what's critical of other scholars and of the way the field's organized. Mm -hmm. I think it is contribution to the field, right? How, how are you opening up a new area that we hadn't seen, not just in the terms of its content, but in terms of how it has us thinking about either film studies or German studies or German film well, studies? Or I think on, what is that category? That I, I think on the one hand, it probably in, interjects into this question of a national cinema and the fact that, that in film studies, at least, German cinema is kind of not present beyond the two uh, avant-garde and ar artistic films. So, but that's not just what a cinema makes and is. A cinema is much more diverse, especially if we're talking about national cinema. There's a lot that goes into this category. And by ignoring that, we're kind of limiting German film towards these two highlight shining moments and kind of saying, this is German film, but that's, not, that's just not just German film. So by looking into these other genres and kind of giving them their due, you rewrite uh, um, the, the German film history in the sense that you actually put it on the radar of film studies. So the critical intervention here would be to reveal um, how issues of the, the expressionism and, and stuff that has been seen as very important is actually not just a highlight that happens, but it's kind of a starting point for a whole continuation of, of moments of diversity in which German cinema can strive. And especially in the, in the post-millennial <coughs> film, uh, and there has been do work done on New German, uh, on, on uh, the Berlin School, there has been work done on the migration film, uh, and, and if you connect all of these together, you get the image of a very diverse and very productive cinema because of the transnational input. And I think it's very important for film studies to recognize that because there's a lot to be learned about more than Hollywood. And this is the same thing that goes on with, with film studies at the moment, for example, with Indian film, with Bollywood, with the idea of uh, different kinds of production uh, that happens there. Um, it's uh, something that happened a couple of years ago with J-horror, uh, with the South Korean film production. Um, film studies is opening up towards international perspectives, but so far there's very little that kind of opens the German market to this. And Germany still remains very much limited to that. So from a critical point of view, I'm guessing um, the, the biggest benefit would be not so much for German studies, which is getting more and more aware of it, but for film studies especially, which is something that um, critics have mentioned. There's a, a special issue of German Quarterly 2012, which deals exactly with that question, which, which kind of proposes that German film studies is, is growing but doesn't really get across the idea that this needs to be in film studies too. We need that input to deal with how do German films do things differently maybe? How do we interact with it? And as a, an especially interesting point would be the inclusion of 1960s uh, uh, films such as the Edgar Wallace series into the canon of horror films and, and mystery films or suspense films because they're opening up a completely different history as to what is seen as popular culture during the time. If we're, if we're talking about German film history and we're talking about the 1960s, we're kind of just talking about new German cinema. But there's a lot more going on which kind of is completely ignored, which needs, I think, which can kind of hopefully be uh, interjected into that. And I have actually, uh, how much impact that is going to have on film studies? No idea yet because I haven't looked at it yet, but uh, I'm hoping there's more there. I, I think hell actually shows that there is a potential here. Yeah, I, I was uh, just thinking about the uh, uh, teaching context of teaching horror films. Uh, since these are very intense pictures, mm -hmm. intense stories, is there anything off limit for you? In terms of teaching? Uh, no, in terms of showing. <laughs> um, not really sure what the legal department here would say to that. I would have to, <laughs> I don't, no idea, but uh, I think they're all adults, right? Uh, in in uh, America, I think the rating is R and that's 17 and over. So um, I would probably put out a disclaimer before showing something like the German Kettensiegen Massacre um, or people eating other people or you know having sex with corpses in Necromantic probably would mean putting out a disclaimer first that this is not for the faint of heart. But other than that, why would it be a problem if students elect to see uh, or go to a, f um, uh, a course on horror film? 
but from the from the proposals I've given you, you've you've seen that I didn't choose horror film as my <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So um, you can actually implement this into the uh, into the bigger category of the fantastic and use horror as one aspect of it. And um, in terms of teaching, I think that's very interesting because you can teach different aspects of popular culture and how to explain culture differently from it. And um, we talked about um, giving them tools to interpret texts of whatever kind. And this is, you can do this with, with the, these films as well. I'm probably not going to show necromantic on one of those syllable, syllabi, no, I don't think. But technically, why not? You could. I'm, I'm not really sure if uh, there's a course on horror film uh, at the moment. Not sure what her syllabus is looking like. It's, it's yeah. much worse than that. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's intense. I mean, if you're, if you're teaching a film like Hostel, you can teach a film like this. So, um. so, so just a, a provocation. Well, I was just wondering, you know, sort of thinking about you know, hell, for example, and if you, how would you, or would you include that in a, in a course on contemporary German film? Yes, uh, why not? And how would you contextualize it? What would the sort of the narrative be in, the, in that course? And then what do you well, want to say about German film? Is, is, it, is it the diversity or is it sort of the, the topoi that are being brought up? Well, um, it depends on how the, the course is structured, of course, what the focus of the course is. If the focus of the course is the fantastic film, you can just use this as a very good example of the crossover between science fiction and horror and how it opens up the question of genre here and, and where to put it. and, and um, if it's a film history of German, contemporary German film, which deals with all broad aspects of German contemporary film, I think it's interesting to put this out there as a possibility of using very specific, I mean, if you're doing Der Untergang, that's a very German topic and a very German genre. But if you're doing uh, Das Finstere Tal and you're talking about Western, um, why not do this and talk about uh, uh, horror and how this one is different? Um, and of course, in a broader and more elaborate analysis, there's more to how Germanness is produced here, right? It's a very broad and, and fast overview. Because I, I wasn't really quite sure who's going to be sitting here, how much of German history and German film history I can, and I can suppose. So I figured I'd need to mix the, the, the talk up a little bit, give a little bit of information first before going into a deep analysis. So obviously the deep analysis is not as deep as it could be. And there's actually a, an, a final scene in the movie uh, which kind of evokes uh, Red Riding Hood because of a, a, a red hoodie that's being used, but it's completely turned around again. And it's, it's also a commentary on, of course, the, the fairy tale, how we use fairy tale, how it is conventionalized in America. Um, there's more in it, um, which I couldn't obviously all unfold here. But um, I think there's a... Um, you can, you can make this work in different contexts. I've used Tolkien's Lord of the Rings for uh, class distinctions, I've used it for ecological problems, and I've used it for just, uh, this is how it is marketed. Um, so options are there, I think. Are any of these made with subsidies, and do these represent a post-subsidy era cinema? Um, actually, uh, um, with the film that I've just discussed, of Hell, uh, it's both a German and a Swiss subsidy, and the final bit of money came from Paramount. So they kind of pieced it together from different sources, which is very interesting because uh, I, I talked about the subsidies before, and New German cinema subsidies were very elaborate uh, and gave a lot of uh, subsidy to critical art. In the 1980s and 90s with the cinema of consensus, this has kind of shifted. The idea was that critical art isn't really what the audience wants anymore and that subsidies need to be given to people with the prospect of actually getting the money back in, <laughs> which I thought is very, uh, isn't that kind of not the point of a subsidy, but okay. Uh, this is what they've done, so uh, cinema of consensus kind of produces a conformity, um, which is exactly the reason why uh, a narrative like there is no German horror film works so well because it's rarely subsidized because there's people sitting there kind of going, ooh, horror film, German, hmm, does that work? Uh, so it's, it's very interesting to see that, that this is changing and it's, these are, for example, these are very, um, uh, these are very commercial films, but this one is actually the debut film of, of someone just out of film school. Uh, this is the second film by him, which is then again subsidized by Austrian and German film productions. Um, 
the same goes here. The, the first one of these is uh, a film debut from someone just out of school, uh, As Is Hell, uh, which is also his first film after he's done an amazing, uh, you talked about demo or die, right? So th they, they did a film demo, which is his final project, which is usually a short film or a very short, uh, actually, Rambok is very interesting because this is part of the ZDF Serie, this kleine Film Fernsehspiel. So this is the second German television channel, uh, um, state channel, which has this, uh, uh, this production series of TV films, which take up about only an hour to an hour and a half. This one's only an hour long. Um, and they've been subsidizing new filmmakers with innovative ideas since the 60s and 70s. I think even Firko Schlindorf did one there. So um, it's, it's a bit mixed with these. Uh, some of them are commercial products, some of them are subsidized. Um, so, yeah. Well, we've hit the hour, so uh, thanks very much. Appreciate your... Uh, Thank you for, for being here. And <laughs>